Hello everyone, welcome to our training today. I'm Alvina Alametsa and we will today have this uh, training on EU and feminist foreign policy. I'm happy to have you all here and also welcoming the guest speakers. This event is organized in collaboration with the Finnish Green Educational Center Visio and it's funded by the European Network of Political Foundations. And last week we had our first session of this training course discussing EU and peace. And today we will go a bit deeper into this by discussing feminist foreign policy. The language training, uh, the language of this training is English. However, you are also very welcome to comment or ask questions in Finnish, and we will translate if necessary. And you can post any questions or comments at any time of the event, and we will then pick them up from from the comment section, and we will answer them when the time is right for that. And as I said, you can comment through the comment section of YouTube uh, do, during this video that you are now watching. And uh, we will also use Mentimeter at the beginning of the training, which is quite easy to use. I will show you how to do that then. But there are a few ways like this that you can participate during this event and are very welcome to. And a final reminder that the safe space uh, guidelines also apply and are followed in this training. A link to the safer space guidelines is um, is um, in the comments of this video. So welcome everyone, and I will now start um, presenting a little bit and open this uh, training with a small presentation from my part for the feminist foreign policy. And you should be able to see my slides very soon, just a moment. Are you now able to see the slideshow? Yes, you are amazing. So today, as I said, we are going to have a training on EU and feminist foreign policy. And uh, let's see if I can get this also to... Oh. Maybe it works a bit better now, perfect. So first I will give the brief introduction to this topic and uh, then we will go to our two guest speakers of the day, Swedish member of the European Parliament, Jakob Dalunde, and also Lina Ander, who is a gender equality expert in women, peace and security, and also seconded by the Swedish uh, Folk Bedanotte Academy to the European External Action Service. So both of these speakers will then speak approximately 15 minutes and then we will have uh, time for questions and discussion. So what does one mean by the feminist foreign policy? That it, uh, it is based on a conviction that the gender equality are, is a precondition for long-term peace and security in the world. In the last training session, we had a lot of discussion on uh, the positive peace or negative peace, whether peace is only the absence of war or whether it's something more. And uh, at least I think that peace should be something more. It should be something that uh, is including everybody in the society to build the society so that uh, it's not only absence of war, but in a peaceful society, everyone can contribute. And the women's rights are not just a women's issue, but also an issue of human rights and democracy. There is one of the quotes on the feminist foreign policy on how uh, it is defined. And uh, it's also something that uh, I find uh, quite 
quite good here that it's prioritizing peace, gender equality and environmental integrity. So basically, when we talk about feminist foreign policy, there is quite a lot of themes that comes inside of it. It's not only the rights of women, but it's also the rights of minorities. It's the rights of uh, the planet, the nature. There is a lot of um, different things that are included in the feminist foreign policy, so to say. And I think it would be a sustainable kind of foreign policy, inclusive foreign policy that is protecting human rights. And here is also very, very good uh, points about how it seeks to disrupt these colonial, racist or patriarchal uh, power structures. So I think this is what is meant by the feminist foreign policy. And of course, now this sounds a bit theoretical, but then when we look at the decisions that are made in politics, uh, you can see whether some of those decisions are following this feminist thinking and feminist foreign policy thinking, or whether they are not. Basically, the feminist foreign policy is uh, ele elevating the gender equality and uh, human rights of women and marginalized groups. But as I said, it's, it's not uh, only about women, it's not about a certain group. Personally, I believe that the feminist foreign policy is benefiting of all individuals in the society. So it's not only uh, about some certain part of people, but it's uh, more about benefiting the whole of the society. And um, doing so actually means that we also have different groups that partake in conversations and that everybody's human rights are, are being considered. So this is uh, about uh, only also the equal and fair participation in different processes. It's not only about politics but it's also about how people can be involved in society, economy, arts, uh, public discussion. There is a lot of aspects to this. For example, when you have a activity or activism in social media and media in general, are you subjected to hate speech because of your gender or your identity? Or are you allowed to speak freely? So these kind of questions come then about the feminist foreign policy, who is allowed to speak and whether it's safe to do so. That should be our aim, that, that it is safe to speak. And uh, it's very important that if we have a goal of feminist, feminist foreign policy, then we also allocate the resources to match that goal. And this is something that is uh, too often forgotten in the European Union as well, that we speak about very important goals and themes, but then it's only in the level of the speeches and not really always in the level of the actions and uh, also funding. So basically the point here is that we give a lot of attention to different kinds of groups and support the uh, participation of these groups also financially when needed. The feminist foreign policy, to my opinion, is very relevant to the European Union. We still have a lot of discrimination, violence, also gender-based violence and violence against marginalized groups. But then also we have wide issues that are not uh, targeting any certain group, but the planet and people in general, such as hunger and food insecurity, poverty and lack of access to any kind of basic services, for example, healthcare. And then it's, of course, the crisis of, of climate, climate crisis, that uh, is very much stressing the planet at the moment and also the people on it. Uh, for example, some examples of how, how also we need the feminist foreign policy to protect children is the fact that girls are still denied access to education in, in many parts of the world. And uh, there is a lot of discrimination inside education as well, also in the European Union for example, against um, some of the sexual minorities or other minorities. And then we also have a lot of issue with um, not being represented in governments or decision making. Um, for example, women are not so much um, still allowed in these rooms where decisions about foreign policy are made. We also see this in the European Union that we have only a small amount of women who partake these kind of decisions. When you look at delegations who are leading different European Union delegations, 
uh, there is a small minority that are women, I think around 30% at this point. So we can we can see this also inside the European Union. It's not only something that happens globally that we are concerned about the role of women, but it's also inside the Europe, European Union and Europe. And I think here it's important to note that the gender equality and human rights are a core value of the European Union, at least they should be. Uh, I have been a bit uh, concerned about the fact how, how silent uh, European uh, Union countries are, for example, on abortion rights and uh, different discrimination, discriminative laws, for example, that are being set now in Poland and Hungary. And uh, I think that this does not reflect the certain idea of human rights and uh, and uh, gender equality. But um, as you know, there are these kind of issues that we do think that these are the core values of the European Union. But does the EU actually act when it's needed is very much the question. However, uh, also there is an absence of the gender perspective when we are looking at the response to global challenges. And uh, this is something that we should tackle. Uh, there are also many different um, different documents in which we are trying to adopt these gender equality approaches and um, working together also globally on this topic in different forums such as the UN. But the important thing is to apply the gender equality and human rights into all kinds of different sectors of policy such as trade, development, security and so on. And this is where we most often fail, in my opinion. There is the difficulty of uh, saying something about trade, for example, and pushing forward business opportunities and trade cooperation. But then when doing so with certain countries, with certain companies, human rights are often neglected. For example, this is one issue with, uh, with the EU, EU at the moment. Then some concrete examples about feminist foreign policy and how is that related to peace? Well, uh, one of the core goals, of course, is to increase the women's involvement in peace building and also different peace processes. Uh, and then to have zero tolerance in conflict related violence, also sexual violence. And uh, it's very important here to have support to civil society, for example, uh, human rights, but also women's rights organizations and human rights defenders in, in different countries. These are very important ways to shift the societies in a way that they would be more answering to feminist policy and feminist foreign policy, ensuring financial support to those organizations, for example. Very much something that we discussed also in the, the um, youth peace and security training. It's very important to integrate gender to all conflict analysis that has been made and is being made. And this is something that we still should develop further in the European Union as well. And then ensure the women's representation also in the senior positions in the EU structures, which I also mentioned that we have issues with as well. Um, and we should have uh, we should have more of a 50-50 kind of percentages in different positions rather than having this enormous gap between the participation of men and women in certain peace and security related questions. Basically, to adopt this feminist foreign policy, we need a new perspective. I think we should look into um, how, to, how do we shift this world in a way that we include everybody in the decision making processes. And it's not only about uh, about what kind of practices we are putting. For example, we can set up certain funding criteria for uh, certain projects to have uh, women involved and uh, for a certain percentage, for example. We can set certain percentages for, um, for different EU delegations to have a certain number of females in them. But this does not work if we don't have the right mindset for it. In the last training we had, there was actually a really great example of what is the issue with the women participating in peacemaking processes. Hussein al told us a very concrete example that, uh, that basically uh, women are often not able to participate because they have also child care duties and such duties that, that basically prevent them from participating processes and that we still have issues with the EU, for example, 
funding supportive services that would enable women to take part in peace processes in different parts of the world. And also different kind of discrimination and bullying and harassment, as mentioned, can definitely prevent uh, the ad adoption of feminist foreign policy and making that happen. Because even though uh, women would be participating in paper, it is very difficult to participate if you are not allowed in all of the important decision making, for example. Um, so I think there are many different ways that we should build on this mindset and uh, also we have to we have to make this uh, just a, a practice, not really rely on only speaking about it, but also making it a very coherent practice. And I think that the EU should adopt this kind of thinking if we really are up for gender equality, then feminist foreign policy would be one of the answers to that. There are a lot of challenges to, to how we uh, integrate the feminist foreign policy thinking. Uh, I also mentioned that there are difficulties in, uh, in uh, putting it uh, to practice in diplomacy, development cooperation, but also military and defense that are even more difficult. There are issues, for example, uh, in the fact that um, how, how can women partake in security policy, political decision making uh, when they are often um, not allowed to go to the army, have this kind of training, or that they are allowed, but it's uh, in a structural way very difficult to do so. So there are certain gender gaps here as well that happen, sometimes even because of the law. And there is also this gap be between the rhetoric and practice. People often say it would be important to have women involved, but then in reality, uh, it might not happen. Then, of course, I think that the feminist foreign policy should definitely include different kind of uh, cultural contexts and diversity. But there is an issue of um, it often happening in these Western norms, so to say, in, in terms of liberal feminism. And I think that uh, this is something that must be looked into very critically. Like, how do we actually consider different kinds of group of people and not go about it in a certain academic lens only? Uh, feminist foreign policy as a concept has already been adopted in some countries, for example, Sweden that has pioneered with the feminist foreign policy programs, uh, Canada, France, Luxembourg, Spain and Mexico. There are, of course, issues where, where a country might say that they have adopted this agenda, but, you know, it's probably never really um, ready. I would say this is a pro process and, um, and uh, this kind of thinking is evolving in time and that's what feminist foreign policy is about. Probably we are never completely ready with gender rights, but the point is to start that work. But it's important that these countries that say that they adopt the feminist foreign policy do not only rely on saying that, but also try to make it into a reality in practical terms. And there is a lot of a uh, lot of uh, issues still in that development. Okay, um, let's see. I think I have um, reached the end of my slides, even though I thought. Okay, well, probably so. So uh, in this case, I think that we can finish my uh, part here and bring on the guest speakers. And then at that point, uh, after the first guest speaker, we will have a bit more of discussion and comments as well. But this was just an introduction to the topic. So we will have a lot more food for thought as well and for you to set up some questions in the comment section as well. But first of all, I would like to, uh, um, to invite here to the stage Jakob Dalunde, who is hopefully here and uh, ready to take the floor. So, uh, Jakob, yes, excellent. Hi, Alvina. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm pretty great. Uh, good to be with you. Amazing. That's great to hear. And uh, I'm very happy to give you the floor so that you can give us a, a presentation from your perspective. And then I will ask you some further questions. So go ahead, Jakob, and welcome. It's very nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so for those who are listening, uh, who have met, not, met, not yet met before, my name is Jakob Delunde, and I'm a member of the European Parliament. Um, and I'm in the member of the foreign policy 
uh, committee here in the European Parliament. And previously, I was in the National Swedish Parliament in the Defense Committee and the Foreign uh, Policy uh, Committee. And I'm very proud that the government that the Greens was part of in Sweden between uh, 2014 and 2022 uh, was a pioneer, as you said, in uh, promoting a feminist foreign policy. And I now have the honor to speak a little bit about the experiences uh, that we had. So uh, slide two, uh, please. So there's no way around uh, the numbers. The world is still by an overwhelming majority run by men and the European Union is no exception. Out of the 29 members of the European Council, only five are women. And only Germany, France, Slovenia and Sweden currently have female foreign ministers and Sweden will now uh, get a new uh, government, a conservative government, and we don't yet know if the future um, uh, foreign minister will also be uh, Swed uh, female. Now, why is that important? Well, representation matters. Sure, there are examples of female political leaders who do not really promote feminist policy policies. We can see it now uh, in the UK with the Liz Truss, and we also had recent elections uh, in Italy uh, with a female leader who uh, would not be considered a person who is promoting uh, feminist foreign policy. Uh, but those are generally exceptions to the rule. In general, the better the representation of women, the better policies for women we get. Slide three, please. So the Swedish uh, foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy was launched in 2014 by Margot Wallström's appointment as foreign minister to the new Social Democrat and Green government. And we did this in response to the discrimination and systemic subordination that, that still characterizes everyday life for countless women and girls across the world. And feminist foreign policy is an agenda to change uh, the future and strengthen rights, representation and resources for all women and girls. Slide four, please. The feminist foreign policy is based on the three R's. First, rights, referring to the ambition to eliminate gender-based infringements on human rights, such as forced marriage, female genital mutilation, as well as having the Swedish foreign ministry working actively for equal rights and access for women and girls to education, health, inheritance, the labor market, and public participation in general. It is also about the resources, both for the actual foreign policy to fund uh, female participation in foreign policy, but also resources for women in general, in the economy, in the health services, in education, and so on. And finally, representation, to ensure that women are active participants in foreign policy and on levels. Next slide, please. So why am I, a straight white guy from Northern Europe, talking about feminist foreign policy? Well, that's because gender equality matters to us all and benefits us all. Sure, the primary purpose of feminist foreign policy is support women, but I genuinely believe that a feminist world that smashes the patriarchy is actually better for us all, even myself uh, as a man. And we have the research to back this up. Research shows that gender equal societies enjoy better health, stronger economic growth, and greater security. It also shows that gender equality contributes to peace and that when women are involved in peace process, the likelihood of lasting peace increases. Much of the Swedish uh, feminist foreign policy draws on United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, universally adopted in the 2000s, which recognizes the particularly difficult situation women in conflict and emphasizes their crucial role in accomplishing sustainable peace and security. Next slide, please. So 
So has it been a success? Well, the success of former, uh, the former government's uh, feminist foreign policy should neither be over or underestimated. Has it really been a feminist foreign policy in its entirety? Well, not really. There have been many decisions taken in terms of foreign policy that to some extension go against the principles of feminist foreign policy. There has been some examples such as weapons export to Saudi Arabia, a country which, uh, repre um, with repression to uh, women. But there has been some success in the feminist uh, foreign policy. Some examples. Uh, we have uh, generally, uh, regularly championed the issue within the United Nations Security Council when we were part of that um, between 2017 and 2018. Uh, we, we have resolutions in 2017 that references to women, peace and security that was made for the first time um, in the Security Council's history. It has never been done before. We also championed the UN Security Council's inclusion of information from representatives from women's rights organizations in its analysis. We contributed to sexual and gender-based violence becoming a separate listing criterion in the UN sanctions regime, which creates opportunities for us to use UN sanctions to fight uh, sexual and gender-based violence. We cooperated with and provided support for the UN's special representatives um, for the Secretary General on sexual violence in conflicts. We also contributed towards uh, women's participation in peace work in a number of countries, including Afghanistan, Colombia, Mali, and Syria. And throughout um, Swedish agencies, we have carried out extensive training for both Swedish and international part personnel taking part in peace initiatives. Within the European Union, we have been a driving force behind the establishment of a senior advisor in the European External Action Service in matters relating to gender equality and women, peace and security. And for example, we took part in drawing up the EU action plan for gender equality and women's empowerment in the EU external relations between 2016 and 2020. Feminist uh, foreign policy was a clear profile issue for Sweden's work within the European Union in general. By systematically and continuously repeating this message, Sweden developed a predictability, which in turn has led to those who are responsible for drawing up versions of text of increasingly anticipate Swedish input by including references to women and gender equality from the get-go. An example of this uh, was this uh, free trade agreement with Chile, uh, which for the first time uh, the European Union proposed an entire chapter on gender equality, and Sweden played a key role in this. We also contributed uh, towards a more integrated gender equality perspective in the EU civilian and mili military crisis management efforts, including by working to strengthen gender equality expertise within the EU's institutions and initiatives. Next slide, please. So what has been the success factors in implementing the feminist foreign policy? First is clear leadership. And here Margot Wallström played an extraordinary role as an experienced and efficient and prominent politician with credibility uh, to fight for a feminist foreign policy. Um, and she does this across the board. References to, to feminist foreign policy in speeches, articles, social media, and clearly prioritizing these issues during visits, trips, uh, meetings with other heads of states or, and, and foreign ministers. Repeating this within the Swedish Foreign uh, uh, Policy Service in the management and regional meetings. And frequent assignments to uh, the Foreign Service on delivering these messages and proportions. Um, next slide, please. There has though been some skepticism. 
uh, when presented back in 2014, the Swedish um, uh, articulated feminist agenda was met with both enthusiasm and skepticism. Critics described it as a PR trick, a superficial rebranding to charm the public opinion. And Sweden's feminist foreign policy is still sometimes met with resistance that, ma that manifests itself in different ways. For example, through the suppression techniques, such as ridiculing and making uh, the invisible, visible invisible. And there are some constructive ways of tackling this skepticism. For example, the following arguments for gender, increasing gender equality. Such as the global economy would grow by 26% if women and men were equal in the working life. And research shows that uh, the proportion of household income spent on children's development increases significantly when women have greater control of the resources of the household. And this has been very important in our development uh, cooperation. When you, when you support poor people in other parts of the world, if you make sure that it is women who get the resources instead of the men, that is much more often spent on things that are actually good for the entire family and especially the children, so that they get better nurtured, better access to education, and better protection from uh, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And if women were able to farm on the same terms as men, 100 million people would avoid going hungry. And a final argument, research shows that gender equal societies are more peaceful, and a growing number of studies indicate that pre peace processes and peace agreements that include both women and men are more sustainable. Next slide, please. So what is a good way to work in order to support the feminist foreign policy? Well, here's a checklist. First, win support and encourage leadership for gender equality at the highest possible level, including both female and male political, military, religious, and economic decision makers. Second, work to include gender equality in all steering documents and checklists on all political levels. Third, find like-minded actors, forge alliances, and drive forward issues together with them or interact with them. Fourth, broaden the ownership for issues through dialogue and cooperation with new groups. I think it is important to really to, really to emphasize that the feminist foreign policy isn't only a, a thing for middle class white women. It needs to be a much broader movement than that. And here we have some work to do. Um, another checklist is to create and support flat platforms that more actors are made with, visible and can contribute. Establish exchanges of experience and knowledge between different actors, networks, breakfast clubs, lunch circles, or seminars like this. Use dialogue with international, national, and local women's rights organizations and other, other human rights and civil society organizations support them, but also make use of their knowledge, problem analysis, and proposals, which are the, of, the, of the importance to be sustainable. These are some examples that um, we, that I think benefited us in Sweden in working on the um, Swedish feminist foreign policy, and I hope that they can be useful uh, to you. And I'm now um, interested to hear your uh, comments uh, and questions. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. And here you can find uh, a handbook of the Swedish uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry. Uh, they have a, a very, very good uh, handbook uh, that you can use. Thank you so much, Jakob, for a very inspiring presentation. And I think it's a great overview also about what Sweden is actually doing about the feminist foreign policy, going a bit beyond the theory into the practical part. 
Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure if we have any questions yet in the YouTube channel, but I would like to ask you something to begin with. Um, I, I wonder uh, if you can give like uh, just a brief word of encouragement of why all of the European Union countries should adopt it. Like if you if you have to pick like one point why it is important to you, how would you sell it from the Swedish perspective? <laughs> well. Uh I think that um, you have to use different communications to some extent, depending who you are talking to. Um, on the one hand, you need to be able to mobilize support among those who already believe in the merits of uh, feminist foreign policy, but you need to, to, to show that it really can be done. And here are examples um, uh, of success uh, are really important. But I also think it is important that we try to reach out to those who don't necessarily believe in feminism uh, at all and not give up on trying to, to talk to, to those groups and try to explain that, that feminism isn't only uh, a project for, uh, only for women. There are so many merits on um, making sure that the patriarchy does not limit the life choices also for men. As um, men are also at risk of um, violence, men are at risk for uh, depression, loneliness, um, um, more women uh, take their lives than, than, than women, for example. And I think that, of course, it's a difficult sell, but I truly believe that gender identity, to some extent, plays a part in, in that, in, in the way that men are supposed to be pride proud, which does not really help in a peace agreement. I think if, if uh, Vladimir Putin had been trained in, in feminist uh, ideology, maybe he would have been more likely to, to accept um, uh, a peace with Ukraine rather than having to, to lean on this, uh, this image of the strong man who is never defeated and is never wrong and can never consider an alternative route. So, so I think it's not only important to make sure that less men and more women participate in foreign policy, but also that, that we get more men who are not necessarily the same kind of um, old school uh, patriarchal man who, who has to be a political leader in a very specific way in order to be a quote unquote real man. And, and that is what I'm trying to do myself. Thank you, Jakob. Yes, that's actually very interesting. And in the last training we had, we discussed quite a bit about these roles and also about mental health and emotional skills and uh, how the world could be a better place if many of the world leaders would have had a bit more training also from early years on uh, about um, emotional skills and such things. So I think it's very important that you raise that kind of point. There is a question from Riikka Kaukoranta in the chat and it goes as follows. I know that promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights is a priority in Sweden. How has this been acknowledged in the feminist foreign policy? So, yes, Jakob, perhaps if you can answer this, how, how is the sexual and reproductive health uh, and rights um, acknowledged inside the feminist foreign policy thinking? How, how does uh, Sweden combat that especially? Well, uh, the, the, the first thing that, that comes to mind is that um, both through development cooperation, we provided funding for um, security in migration camps. Um, which are areas where women are extremely vulnerable, both to either migrant men, but also to uh, security guards uh, uh, in these migration camps. And it's, it's extremely important to fund training both for the security guards, but also um, for the managers to, to be able to spot um, men who abuse uh, uh vulnerable women in in a vulnerable situation as a, as a migrant camp but we we did not only do that in terms of funding we also sent uh through uh, the swedish defense we sent uh, military trainers who themselves had been trained uh in 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 uh, uh, a gender perspective 
to uh, to, part to to help train um, security guards in uh, um, in uh, in migration camps, and and also in the uh, uh, we had a force in Afghanistan. Um, uh, where we sent gender experts who were e embedded in the patrols who own or, or, or uh, to some extent were there to help the swedish soldiers be more feminist in their approach both towards each other but also towards the uh, the population but also to be able to speak to vulnerable women on the afghani uh, countryside um to to, to make sure that um, you get a better di di discussion between uh, uh, a patrol of Swedish soldiers and us. Thank you, Jakob. That's a very great concrete example. And uh, also, um, I just want to raise something about this. Um, here in Finland, in Helsinki, I was part of this initiative uh, to set up a free um uh like um how do i translate it to english but um uh, free you know tampons and pads like menstruation products in schools so that young girls can have those for free and i think that uh, you know many projects that there there are from finland sweden also other countries that are you know for example have this goal of having these free menstruation products available is quite concrete as well part of these reproductive rights and uh, and you know um, and reproductive health and uh, feminist foreign policy because many girls are prevented from going to school because they don't have these sanitary products, for example. And so it can be very concrete. It can have a meaning in the, the life of this girl, like how, how can she go to school and how can she focus on that, for example. So I think these are very interesting things. And uh, feminist foreign policy is often about answering the biggest challenges of equality, the biggest everyday life challenges of people have regardless of the gender of course but um i can, think it's, can I yeah, one yeah, more example yeah please yes so um um a couple of months ago um i me and some colleagues were at the border between ukraine and poland to uh, both uh, get a better of an understanding of the situation and also to a little to do a bit of voluntary work uh, to, to support people uh, in a vulnerable situation and uh, one thing that I, that not I as a man uh, noticed when I arrived there, but, um, but a female colleague of mine, she realized that there are no places at the border for women to uh, take care of their feminine hygiene. And all the people who were running this small transit camp at the border were men. Uh, and I assume that it was maybe not that easy for, for a woman uh, to go up to a guard handling the, the, the camp and say, where can I breastfeed uh, my, my child? Where, where can I uh, perform the changes of, of various things? Um, um, so, so we ended up going to, to the supermarket and we bought a tent and we, and we put it up. Uh, and and we 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 put up a sign and make, make to make make sure that only women uh, can enter this this tent uh, in order for for them to have a not entirely secure but at least some some protection in order to 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 address the specific needs that women have. And this is just one example. But I I truly believe that if if, if I uh, a, a, at least somewhat feminist acting person did not think of it um, at that point. And I would say it's quite likely that most security guards or uh, transit camp managers are maybe less, have a less feminist insight than, than I do. Then probably situations like this are across the world where, where women have a, have, a, have a tougher time uh, handling just their basic needs and taking care of, of their children. Um, so just having a few women uh, participating in the managing of that transit camp was quite helpful, actually. 
Yes, exactly. That's amazing. And that's a great example. It's very important because, uh, you know, often these kind of challenges are easier, easily seen when you are a bit more in a similar kind of life situation or the same gender or so on. So this is why there should be various genders and women as police officers, for example, women in border control and different genders in all of the tasks that we have in the society but uh, thank you so much Jakob I think you have done such a great career in Sweden uh, both in the parliament the European parliament as also in the Swedish young greens and pushing for the feminist foreign policy for many years so I think that uh, the listeners are eager to hear also more from you later on and uh, to follow your career and I hope we have a chance to discuss a bit further here as well but first we will uh, take uh, Lena here to to present um, present her um, set as well so at this point I thank you Jakob thank you so much bye bye yes thank you and yes um, now next up after Jakob we have Lena and there as I mentioned, Lena is a gender equality and women, peace and security expert. And uh, she, she's holding the position of gender responsive leadership expert in the team of the um, European External Action Service ambassador for gender and diversity. So she has a long experience also in different, uh, different um, positions in the European External Action Service, Services, for example, uh, as an advisor on gender and women, peace and security to the civilian operations commander in the civilian planning and conduct capability. And also she has served in Kosovo as a gender advisor for EU mission. And um, yes, uh, has basically very extensive uh, experience on this topic. And uh, I believe that uh, Lina uh, is also now here on board with us and is able to participate in the discussion and give her remarks to us. And uh, again, I remind all of you to put your comments and questions in the comment section so then we can ask Lena some questions after her presentation. Welcome, Lena. Very happy to have you here. Ah, okay. Uh, apparently, Lena is. Uh, no, yes. Ah, amazing. Great. Yes. Can you Welcome, hear me? Lina. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very How are much. You? Yes, I'm doing very well. Thank you. Um, I, I'm very happy to be here with you and uh, share of some of my insights into how we in the EU, and um, particularly in the External Action Service, work uh, on the implementation of women, peace and security commitments. Um, so I, I could not be with you before, so I just came in and uh, just to tell you that I just came from a meeting with um, a Palestinian NGO um, where we had a meeting also with the EU special representative on, on human rights um, and my boss uh, uh, Stella Rona Grobacic who is the EAS ambassador for uh, gender and diversity issues she's uh, on a duty trip so she could not be there but uh, you know this is just to give you an example of what uh, can a day look like here in the external action service when we work on women peace and security so really interesting to have this direct exchange with uh, NGOs working on the ground and in particular on issues such as uh, gender-based uh, violence in the current, current context in the Palestinian authorities, uh, occupied territories, I should say. Um, but now I'm here and I would like to um, talk a bit about uh, the EU framework for women, peace and security. But I thought also because my background um, from, from different... Um, uh, levels, so to speak, in the EU system. It could maybe be interesting if I also uh, try to, uh, if we start with the overall framework, then we can also go down a little bit to the more practical implementation of this agenda, which I, I would assume uh, would be interesting for, for you. Um, so I will start my presentation. It's coming here on, on the screen. Uh, and now I just have to figure out how to change the slide. So the EU's uh, Women, Peace and Security Framework, uh, we, we've had um, 
a long-standing commitment to fully implement the Women, Peace and Security uh, agenda uh, with the 10 UN Security Council resolutions uh, in our uh, policy framework. Um, and uh, in 2018, uh, we have launched a new uh, framework, which we call the Strategic Approach to Women, Peace and Security. Uh, and on this uh, occasion, we had uh, council conclusions on women, peace and security. And this was um, uh, taken through the council and uh, uh, adopted on the 10th of December 2018. And that was the first time that we had the council conclusions on women, peace and security. And our new framework, uh, strategic approach uh, to women, peace and security, which was an update of a previous uh, framework, was uh, thereby also endorsed by the member states. Um, but what has happened, I think, most recently uh, in the policy development sphere in the EU is that we have now um, put in place our third gender action plan. Maybe you have heard about it, the gender action plan uh, of the EU. And um, with this adoption, we also have for the first time integrated the Women, Peace and Security framework within our overall uh, gender action plan. So this action plan is uh, steering the all the EU external actions and on how to integrate a gender perspective. Um, and uh, I personally find it a very important step forward that we were able to uh, join these, these two frameworks uh, so that we uh, work um, with this in an integrated approach. So here, what you see on the on the screen is uh, a couple of our EU leaders uh, and their quotes uh, on the day when we launched the Gender Action Plan 3. And I thought we could start with just uh, having um, a very short um, look at the, at the video clip that uh, basically in 90 seconds summarize what is the whole, uh, the whole Gender Action Plan three about and uh, and also then how it incorporates the uh, women peace and security angle so i would like to ask in the organizers adil if you can please help to um turn on this short video clip let's see if we have some response on that Thank you very much. And now we go back to the slides. So we had a very quick look at uh, this gender action plan and what could then ask what is new with this um, compared to, to our previous, previous um, action plans? Well, what we can see um, is that we, we have a, uh, what we refer to as a transformative approach. Um, and uh, we do not, in the EU now use the feminist foreign policy. Um, however, the transformative approach is, I think, um, very much similar. 
So what we mean by this is basically that we have to ensure that we have uh, a gender perspective in all our policies and actions. And that means, of course, also that we uh, will understand, we will analyze and see the, the gender norms and stereotypes uh, and, and all the different aspects that gender plays in our um, different policies and action fields. And I think that with this, if we really do it, and we have been talking about it for, for years, but we need also to invest and all the time work on strengthening and enhancing this mainstreaming, then we will also have this um, possibility to transform gender roles and to really contribute to gender equality. So this is very important. Uh, and, and what we can also see has, has more emphasis is the, the role of the leadership. Um, and this means that we also now really speak about having a gender responsive and balanced leadership. And we can uh, we have had evaluations of our previous um, actions and action plans. And what we could conclude is that basically the committed and the supportive uh, leadership is uh, a missing piece of the puzzle. Um, and this means that we also need to work a lot more on uh, making sure that we have everyone on board on what we want to do and how we apply a gender uh, perspective into all our uh, areas of work. So here I can mention, for example, within the EAS uh, and the Commission, we have uh, now put in place um, gender responsive leadership program. So we will start with a with, uh, pilot and uh, uh, allow some of our uh, leaders and uh, senior managers to participate uh, in this. And we also want to uh, really invest more in the capacity and in uh, training staff on, on how to uh, mainstream a gender perspective. Um, we work with the three-pronged approach, um, and this means that we work on the regular mainstreaming, so basically having a gender perspective in uh, all of our uh, regular tasks and actions, whereas we also have the specific targeted actions, could be programs um, or, or projects where we, uh, which have the uh, explicit aim and objective to um, enhance gender balance. And then we have the dialogue, which is really a very important um, instrument that we can use when we have our political uh, dialogues or human rights dialogues with partner countries and, and bring up the issues of, of uh, gender uh, equality in these. Um, and uh, in the video as well, uh, you could see the six different uh, thematics. Uh, these are the, the current uh, priority areas, you could say, uh, of the uh, gender action plan. This doesn't mean that we do not integrate a gender perspective in all our other uh, policy areas, but these are uh, the thematic uh, priorities where you see number five, as I mentioned in the beginning, that we have integrated the women piece and security uh, into this. So basically, um, in the gender action plan, you have one part which is a uh, um, yeah, a framework of all the actions and the indicators, and and um, that that is where you also now have the uh, the full women, peace, and security action plan integrated into the gap three. It's a little bit complicated, but it's very important step that we that we took. Um, so I mentioned already the EU strategic approach to women, peace, and security, uh, which then in 2018 replaced what uh, was previously called a comprehensive approach to women, peace and security. Um, and uh, as I also said, this mainly in very broad terms means that we are fully committed to implement the women, peace and security agenda. Uh, and we include all the five pillars as they have uh, been um, identified in the UN Security Council resolutions. Um, protection, prevention, participation, relief, and, and recovery. Uh, and then we have also the systematic uh, gender mainstreaming uh, and also commitment, strong commitment to increase the EU's uh, internal gender, gender balance. So we very much uh, follow the international framework. Now we're going to speak a little bit what this means in more uh, practical terms for us. Um, and uh, I mentioned this Women, Peace and Security Action Plan, uh, which has been incorporated into the Gender Action Plan. And uh, I have 
I don't have a really possibility to uh, go through the whole uh, action plan, but to give you a few examples. Uh, also, since uh, in, in, uh, in my last uh, eight years, I have been working uh, specifically uh, within the uh, common security and defense uh, policy framework uh, with um, CSDP missions. And uh, in the action plan, we have a few specific commitments that uh, we have made. Uh, and uh, those uh, examples that I have listed here was to ensure dedicated gender advisory capacity. So uh, the EU has now 11 civilian missions deployed uh, to different um, countries. And uh, in some of these missions, we have had full-time gender advisors, but in other missions, uh, there was uh, double-hatted human rights and gender advisors. Um, and uh, therefore we have as uh, an, an implementing measure uh, to this commitment, uh, taking a strategic decision in the EAS a couple of years uh, ago, uh, also in line with what the member states have wanted to have one specific uh, gender advisor as a minimum in every civilian mission and also one uh, human rights uh, advisor. So this is a very concrete um, move forward that I can, um, yeah, that I have seen in the last uh, couple of years here working in the external action service and, and a very positive uh, development. Um, training staff on women, peace and security. This is, uh, of course, very important because we need to work on, on the uh, enhancing the awareness and also supporting our colleagues to know how to integrate a gender perspective and how to take into account the um, the key uh, and main pillars of the women, peace and security in all the work we do. And as an example, I can mention in the civilian CSDP missions, uh, we have in total, as I said, 11 missions and around 2,500 staff. And in the last uh, couple of years, we have uh, set up gender focal point networks in all of the missions. And uh, uh, as a gender focal point, um, you are committing to take up this as an additional responsibility uh, to your other tasks. Um, but um, we think that everyone can do gender mainstreaming. And therefore, uh, we have now 110 persons who have volunteered um, to, to become a gender focal point. And we provide training with the support of a Swedish uh, government agency, the Folk Benedot Academy. We have been able to provide now in the last uh, one year and uh, a little bit more uh, training for almost 100 of those gender focal points, uh, a week long training. And it's very, very important because uh, uh, these are, are people who are not gender experts. Uh, they are experts in various fields, uh, such as uh, police reform or um, perhaps uh, in, in the field of countering violent extremism. Uh, uh, or they can have internal functions in missions such as in human resources or security analysis. And it's very important that we create this um, network and, and uh, support uh, them to, uh, to, to gain the knowledge and skills that you need to be able to apply a gender perspective. So we see really great results uh, from, from this and uh, we can see that the interest internally in the missions race uh, when we have more, more people who are trained and become become more, pro, more actively involved. Uh, in the EAS, we are currently also looking at how we can expand our um, network of gender focal points here internally in both headquarters and delegations. Uh, improved gender balance is uh, something that has been a priority uh, since the um, adoption of this action plan. Um, we, we are working um, proactively on that in the external action service. Um, and also I can mention in the, uh, in the CSDP missions, um, we drafted a strategy and action plan, which was adopted last year and based on which uh, the, 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 the mission uh, missions now are working much more proactively on both uh, recruitment and selection uh, of, of women, but also very much uh, on the, uh, improving the working environment, which is uh, also a very important factor, both in attracting women and also in retaining uh, women in these positions. Still, it's a challenging um, field with CSDP and we have around 26% uh, women only, but that uh, shows that we have even more uh, work to do in that regard. Um, and uh, as one follow-up, 
action to that, and this is also a commitment coming from the Women, Peace and Security Action Plan, was to include gender mainstreaming and women, peace and security in job descriptions. Uh, and this is, of course, really very important, even though we have uh, overall policy frameworks that clearly spell out that uh, including uh, a gender perspective is everyone's responsibility. However, uh, it still makes a difference if you have it in your terms of reference uh, or job description. Um, uh, this uh, spring, actually, in the uh, for the civilian CSDP missions, we had uh, a process where we integrated um, a, a standard sentence into everyone's job descriptions. So this basically made the 2,400 uh, uh, mission members getting this as a specific task mentioned in their um, in their job description uh, through through this uh, process and in. Uh, the same process, we have also included some specific um, requirements and also tasks and responsibilities for uh, management. Uh, and that specifically relates to, uh, for example, upholding a zero tolerance uh, to any uh, form of uh, harassment, including uh, gender-based uh, harassment and discrimination, um, but, but also to proactively uh, promote and engage in um, gender uh, equality and gender mainstreaming. So I think this is also a way that we are trying to take this whole agenda forward. And we are uh, currently also uh, starting, for example, to include more specific uh, references to, to the gender um, yeah, uh, responsibilities uh, for our uh, EU ambassadors um, when they are assigned to, to um, a certain country we are including this in what we call a mission letter. So here we are taking some steps forward in also creating more accountability within our system. And uh, we think that this is uh, very important uh, to, to move forward. So these were a few examples that uh, I've been working on uh, recently. Uh, and then I wanted to give uh, another example at a, a little bit more overall um, level because we work here in the EES uh, a lot also on uh, um yeah multilateral uh, cooperation uh, with different regional organizations and we have uh, made this also a priority within the Wind peace and security action plan um and i have a, a couple of ex examples on how we have taken this forward so we move to the next slide um we have something uh, called the un eu strategic partnership uh, for peace operations and, and crisis management and since 2019 we have now included women peace and security as one of uh, i think it's eight uh, priority areas uh, which also shows that within these important partnerships that women peace and security is an important uh, consideration uh, and to give you a couple of examples of what does this mean in, in practice. Um, so I think um, last year, or one and a half year ago, um, we have undertaken a kind of mapping exercise where we have sent out um, um, a survey to all the peace uh, operations and uh, EU missions and where we have asked about the cooperation between the UN and EU on the ground on women, peace and security related uh, issues. And we have several um, theaters, country contexts, where we have uh, both the UN and an EU mission. And of course, it's very important that we have um, a coordinated uh, approach. So what we could find out from that mapping was that, yes, in, in uh, all of these uh, countries, there is some form of cooperation on women, peace and security. However, we could see, for example, that in some of the uh, mission areas, it was mostly at the technical level and not uh, much at the strategic level. Um, so based on this mapping, that's also something that we can uh, and have tried to take take forward to make sure that it's also a common point on, on the agenda when, for example, uh, heads, heads of mission um, meet. Um, and. Um, Another very important uh, follow-up action that we have done is to organize a joint seminar. Um, this we did end of last year with all the gender advisors um, in both UN and EU missions, which is a great opportunity to have a wider exchange of practice and, and experiences. And also, um, yeah, trying to see how we can work even more uh, together and uh, 
very interesting examples also were shared uh, from country contexts where the cooperation and coordination re works really well. Um, and, and this we can see now is also then um, being applied in other country contexts. So we are currently also working on something called a, a roadmap where we're looking at more concrete uh, things that we can work on together. And one of the things that we want to uh, take forward is to conduct joint conflict uh, and gender analysis. Uh, there was one done as a kind of pilot in uh, a Central African Republic. And, and we think that this is also a way that we can, um, yeah, try to... Uh, support each other to understand better the, the country context and all the uh, women, peace and security uh, aspects and then see how in each uh, mission in this case, uh, this can be um, integrated into the overall work and, and in that uh, way also better coordinate and uh, reinforce each, each other's uh, work. Um, in other partnerships, um, we have, for example, EU-NATO, uh, where a gender perspective is also, and women, peace and security is very important. Uh, so we have, and this is on, on the military side, so we have the, e, the NATO um, international military staff and the EU military uh, staff uh, that came up with a, a joint uh, roadmap on uh, a gender perspective, as they call it. Um, and this is uh, here on the screen, you see the, uh, just examples from this roadmap that um, uh, the aim is, for example, to jointly promote uh, the Women, Peace and Security agenda in the International uh, Cooperation Fora uh, and to promote the gender perspective in the priority areas for international security and defense. Uh, so in... So, um, an area where the women, peace and security agenda is most relevant. Um, and we have also, in fact, a, a more specific EU policy uh, for civilian um, CSDP uh, and civilian and military, actually, uh, common security and defense policy. Uh, and here I have chosen, I think it's two different concrete commitments um, that we have in that policy. And, uh, and here it's, for example, that we are um, committing to integrate a gender perspective when we conduct different outreach projects to the local community and also when we do monitoring and data collections. Uh, and it also says we should ensure that all missions and operations uh, components report systematically on gender aspects as part of their general reporting. So we have in the recent years also uh, really tried to uh, operationalize and provide more guidance to the missions and operations, how they should uh, implement the Women's Peace and Security ad agenda. Uh, I mentioned the gender focal points, uh, the gender advisors that we have, and we also have a more operational uh, guidelines that we have issued from the headquarters uh, level. Um, and that is to try to support and make it more concrete what missions should do on a daily basis. But as you can see, this is also already mentioned uh, in a quite uh, specific and operational terms in our uh, policy on women, peace and security for CSDP. So how do we do this in, in, in practice? I will give you one example from one of the missions in, uh, this is in, in Georgia, where we have the EU monitoring mission. Uh, so basically, the mandate of this mission is to monitor the compliance with the six-point agreement uh, and contribute to stabilization. What it means, um, what the, the main uh, type of, of work that the mission is doing is to uh, have patrols that are uh, patrolling uh, areas uh, close to this administrative boundary line between Georgia and the breakout uh, regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, and uh, then what do we do in practice when we implement um, a gender perspective and think of w, uh, women, peace and security? Uh, so here the mission has done a really good good job in, in improving uh, also uh, their um, 
their work on the ground in terms of a gender perspective. Uh, we try to always have mixed patrols, uh, meaning men and women both in, in the cars when uh, they go out and meet uh, with uh, conflict affected communities or even local uh, authorities uh, representatives. Uh, however, we also have to uh, admit that it is a challenge because uh, we have around 30% women among the think around 120 monitors, which means that in practice, we cannot uh, guarantee that we always have uh, mixed patrols. However, the, the mission um, has reported that it, it is easier for them when they do their job, uh, interacting with the local uh, communities when they have both women and men, because it is easier in that context sometimes, for example, for women to uh, get um, a good relation and, and speak to, to other women. Um, so we, as a mission, tries to also speak to both women, men, boys and girls, um, of course, uh, various groups of women, men, boys and girls, and also try then to collect the information and uh, and do it in a, in a sex disaggregated way, sex and age. Uh, and this uh, also makes it possible for the mission to analyze and see what could possible gender uh, differences be in how they uh, perceive their security situation and what their concerns are. And we can uh, see uh, out of that analysis, uh, for example, that uh, women more often express as a concern, uh, not only the uh, sort of more overall security uh, situation, but they also address in particular the, the lack of access to services for uh, women who are victims of gender-based violence or other health uh, services um, due to that uh, context. So security needs and concerns are very much uh, of a gendered nature. Uh, this is very important uh, as well that we report back to because that's also what is the mandate of the mission. Uh, so the mission, for example, is not able to provide uh, services to gender-based violence victims. What the mission does is uh, basically monitoring and reporting. But this uh, is important uh, aspects that we do um, include and elaborate on this in our reports. And what the mission also have done uh, recently is a, a gender analysis of something called uh, conflict prevention uh, mechanisms. Uh, these are very local uh, conflict resolution mechanisms uh, where um, you know, people coming together from, from the different sides. And uh, the, the mission could conclude based on that analysis that women have uh, to a much less, less extent than men been involved in those uh, uh, meetings for the last five years. And uh, this is mainly due to the fact that um, those that are participating in these um, uh, meetings uh, of this mechanism. They are mostly people from the local authorities or law enforcement agencies, uh, and uh, uh, women are very underrepresented uh, there. Um, and the mission has a role as well to facilitate the, this uh, dialogue in these mechanisms and now try to raise as well um, the fact that the, the lack of women uh, involved also um, means that sometimes issues that are uh, concerns of mainly women uh, are not addressed. It's also challenging how to address this, but uh, the first step is, of course, the analysis and then to uh, take it further and, and discuss with, with the counterparts and uh, try to find alternatives. I think the, the last um, slide, maybe, because my time is uh, going very fast. Um, this is, again, one of the explicit explicit commitments made in our uh, Women, Peace and Security policy for CSDP missions. Uh, and it says that missions and operations should cooperate with the national and local authorities and civil society in order to promote the importance of gender equality, including the fight against sexual and gender-based violence. So in um, um, each of the each of the missions and operations have their specific mandate. Uh, and we have always to, to, to see um, what are we able to do um, to contribute to the implementation of women, peace and security commitments in the specific mission context? Um, and um, we, we had, uh, I, I'm taking one of uh, 
my own examples from my time when I worked in the ULEX uh, mission in Kosovo, which is a rule of law mission, um, which uh, a few years ago also had a very um, wide mandate with an executive uh, part uh, doing investigations and uh, prosecuting uh, war crimes, but also had e another uh, advising, monitoring, mentoring and advising uh, side of the mandate. And um, uh, within the overall mandate to strengthen rule of law in that local context, uh, we were able to um, start quite an extensive um, not not project but extensive role to uh, support the local authorities in handling um, gender-based violence and in particular domestic violence uh, crimes and uh, one of the analysis that we could make uh, working with both police and prosecutors for example was that there was no good cooperation uh, between um, them so we've been able to, uh, with the uh, with the mission, with the advisors, being there basically on a daily basis, working with the local counterparts, also integrating this uh, uh, important work on uh, preventing and, and uh, re addressing gender-based violence. Uh, we were able to, for example, help them to draw up um, uh, protocols on cooperation and coordination. Uh, also, uh, for example, um, help with trainings for police investigators uh, in how to have a victim-centered approach uh, when handling gender-based violence uh, or when interviewing children for example so some sp specific um, support and trainings were provided by the mission and i think what was also very important was just to be uh, just just to pay attention to a very important topic and to uh, discuss it on a daily basis with local counterparts and even at the the higher um, command level um, because we could see that gender-based violence and domestic violence what was not the most prioritized um, area but it was a great concern of the local communities uh, and um, another example then of the of the cooperation uh, we started was to uh, increase uh, awareness raising and for example help with a public um, uh, phone line that uh, victims could uh, call and get support in cases of sexual uh, violence um so i think that we with the uh, csdp missions we could really play a role when it comes to uh, that side, the protection side. The mission also worked on conflict-related sexual violence um, and uh, was also able, for example, to train local prosecutors and, and police investigators in uh, yeah, how to handle uh, conflict-related sexual violence uh, crimes, which is um, uh, yeah, even more sensitive and, and difficult uh, field. Um, I wanted to show you also another example of how we can promote um, the women, peace and security agenda. We have here, for example, the um, head of mission in EUMM Georgia, uh, who the mission has been very vocal and very proactive, uh, engaging in uh, a global campaign, 16 days of uh, activism against gender-based violence which runs every year from the 25th of november to the 10th of december so i think this is also another way on on how we can just having our uh, even high level people and, and leaders to to speak up uh, and uh, how, how the mission supports uh, the work on um, supporting victims of gender-based violence can be really very important in the local context uh, and here we have another uh, similar example. This is from our EU advisory mission in Iraq, where uh, the mission also engaged uh, in, in this uh, global campaign. So when we have 11 missions doing it at the same time and all uh, contributing through social media and, and posting these kind of uh, messages, I think it can be very much uh, support also to um, yeah, move ahead with the work at the local level. And here's uh, yet another picture of where uh, gender focal points came together in one of the missions. It's in Yupol Cops uh, in Ramallah, uh, also in relation to this 16 days of, of activism against gender-based violence. And I think with that, I have uh, concluded my presentation and I am uh, available as well. I, I see I could not really pay so much attention to it, but I understand that we have had some 
uh, questions or comments. So I would um, perhaps ask the organizers as well to, to help navigate in, in this and see how much time we have for questions and answers. Thank you so much, Lina. It has been very interesting and I think it was a really great overview about all of what is being done in the missions and what kind of thinking is there around this topic in the European External Action Service. And yes, I think we have questions from, uh, from our audience, uh, so we can maybe start with that. So there was a great question from Riikka Kaukoranta and she's asking, apparently it's been difficult to promote the... Um, um, Mm. SGBV services in UN Security Council because of the opposition to abortion care and so on. Does EU have a mechanism to ensure these vital services or is this the case? So this is the question from Rika. Maybe if you can answer this, Lina, it would be really interesting to start off with that. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Alvina. And a very good uh, question from uh, Rika. Um, well, of course, there are many different forms of uh, uh, sexual and gender-based uh, violence. Um, and I don't know exactly in, in what context uh, you refer to that it was difficult to, to raise it in the Security Council. Uh, but it is true that uh, when it comes more generally, um, I would say, to both... Um, well, actually, mainly, yeah, both language about gender equality, but also about um, uh, specifically uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, that we, we can see now that there are some, uh, some challenges uh, on the global scene. Um, the EU, of course, we work in so many different uh, ways. Uh, and, uh, and we have the, the commission uh, projects, for example, uh, and we have humanitarian assistance, and we do support um, many, many programs uh, related to ensure services for victims of, of different forms of sexual and gender-based violence, and also uh, supporting sexual and reproductive health and, and rights. Uh, for example, now, I don't know if it was this context that you, you were thinking of, but um, uh, in, in Ukraine, um, there are many reports uh, about the the lack of uh, services uh, exactly for for women, uh, whether they are victims of of uh, sexual gender based violence, whether they are uh, pregnant women or um, other in other ways in need of of services, and there uh, we have been able to provide. Um, uh, support from, from the European Union. From the side of the EEAS, uh, and in that context, we uh, have through uh, also my my uh, boss, uh, the Ambassador for Gender and Diversity, uh, taken a very uh, proactive role in uh, in also uh, having, having contact with the uh, authorities in, in Ukraine and see how we can support uh, them on, on all these ends. And when it comes to gender-based violence. Uh, we also have uh, now uh, a mission with a mandate to support uh, the Ukrainian authorities in investigating uh, conf conflict-related sexual violence. Um, otherwise, I, I think when the EU and uh, our work on gender-based violence, we have a very big uh, program called the Spotlight Initiative. Uh, and uh, that also very much um, uh, deals with sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I know as well that there were some sometimes uh, challenges in, in how uh, and which countries would uh, accept the support, etc. Uh, but of course, we work through the programming, we work through the multilateral um, uh, fora, of course, to, to, to push for, for these issues. Um, and um, uh, we have human rights dialogues with different countries, which is another um, possibility we, we have to, to raise such issues uh, based on um, human rights uh, con conventions and universal uh, rights. So um, there are many different challenges uh, related to that uh, topic, um, but um, I think I, I'm, I'm not really able to go in much more detail uh, right now. 
but the fact is that we have many different um, instruments and different ways in which we can address uh, such such issues and uh, um, you, Ukraine is a country context where we are now also see how important it is that we work together with the joint analysis and making sure that we uh, apply the different instruments and tools in a very in a joined up and, and integrated uh, way so that we haven't left out any important um, angles of how, uh, for example, women are affected in, in the local context and, and uh, uh, support to victims of gender based violence. Thank you, thank you so much, Lina, and thank you, Rika, for a great question on the on the sexual violence and gender-based violence. And uh, I think it's important that we have this kind of projects and uh, more uh, more knowledge on this topic spread on all levels. Also, previously, Rika asked, asked a bit about sexual and pre, pre, uh, pre reproductive rights, and in there, I think there also are some good news. For example, the EU just announced a few days ago that there is extra funding going to happen to UNFPA for sexual and reproductive yeah. rights of uh, 45 million. So I think there is like um, this kind of um, good EU news also, even though we here raise a lot of the obstacles and uh, and all that has to be done. But maybe I would like to also ask some further questions um, actually, Rika had a question also earlier, and I think it was a bit um, more also to to Jakob because of the the uh, situation in Sweden. But um, she was asking that she is also interested in the role of anti-gender movement when implementing the feminist foreign policy, and she was asking if the global anti-gender movement has attacked towards Sweden. But I think that for you, Lina, this might also be a really interesting question. In your work, do you see this kind of a movement and how, how it might impact the different missions and uh, different uh, discussion on feminist foreign policy in the EU level? From my side, I can at least say that we do have quite an um, active lobby of this kind of anti-gender movement into the European Parliament, for example, in reproductive rights and abortion mm -hmm. rights. Uh, we even got some fetus dolls back a year or two ago when um, when there was this anti-abortion movement that was trying to to make us to vote differently in uh, abortion legislation. But um, I was wondering if you if you could be able to also from your perspective answer the question from Rika, Lina. Uh, yes, thank you, and it is a very relevant and. Uh... Uh, good question again and uh, as you're saying it is uh, uh, I think a, a very present uh, challenge that we are uh, facing in different for us at different levels um, and uh, well as I said in in the beginning that uh, the the EU we have not like adopted this feminist foreign policy uh, but um, but of course uh, also within the for example, in our work to implement uh, the uh, thematic priorities of the Gender Action Plan 3, we have uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights is one of those uh, six uh, priority areas. And uh, of course, it becomes uh, challenging uh, when um, these uh, uh, women's rights uh, that we saw I'm wondering whether it's only my internet breaking up or whether it's in the Lina's side. Okay, at least now I can see you again, Lina. I think there was a was a short um, break in uh, the your Wi-Fi or something. So yes, so ah, okay. Please, yes, no worries. Okay, no, I'm sorry about that. Um, so what I was saying was that uh, we, uh, of course, we do uh, 
see this uh, challenge, uh, the anti-gender narrative. It's uh, it's present uh, in many different fora, uh, and it it is becoming uh, a great challenge uh, for for us. Um, at the same time, we have, as I mentioned, uh, in the Gender Action Plan 3, uh, six thematic areas, and sexual and reproductive health and rights is one of those uh, thematic uh, priority areas. Um, I think one of the maybe yeah places where, where it becomes very difficult is now in the uh, multilateral fora, uh, when we have to agree on, on statements, etc., when there are some uh, also states opposing to, to using uh, certain language that uh, has not been an issue uh, in the past. Um, and we also see it um, actually had a very good uh, presentation from, from one of our colleagues in the EAS a while ago and uh, seeing how, how uh, this the, the movement behind this gender um, anti-gender narrative is quite strong and, and well organized. So it's definitely becoming, uh, I would say, by the day, more and more uh, important for, for us also to find uh, ways in uh, handling this. And uh, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that I have a, much more to say on that topic other than that, yes, uh, certainly is a, a great challenge. And um, I'm sure we, we share it uh, with you in Parliament and, and other that is um, probably not going to get easier in, in the next uh, couple couple of years. Uh, but the terminology is uh, sometimes I, I have a feeling as well as a practitioner inside the system that uh, it's very unfortunate when we get stuck in discussing about a small uh, words, ter terminology, when we need to act. Uh, and we have so much important work to do. Uh, and uh, and then um, instead, we, we get a little bit um, uh, upheld, I think, by, by some of these uh, um, discussions on, on just the language to, to use. Yes, exactly. You are right. I think this is a very relevant point that Reika raised here. And it's uh, definitely a risk and a challenge and an undercurrent in a way that I think has an influence on, on all different levels. Uh, so it's something that we must uh, keep keep fighting, fighting on. And for example, in this anti-abortion campaigning that we have had in the parliament, um, basically, uh, like to us, the members of the parliament, there uh, has also been some knowledge that uh, behind this kind of campaigning, there has been funding from Russia, for example. Yeah. And, you know, this is a, also a big foreign policy question, like, uh, how do this kind of very aggressive movements also get their funding? And uh, it's often not even coming from inside the European Union. So I think it's a very complicated thing. But um, but maybe like a bit related to this then, um, because, you know, EU has not uh, officially announced feminist foreign policy. And this is like, of course, one of the core questions that we are working with. So I was wondering, what is like your exact perspective? Do you see it possible that EU would announce having feminist foreign policy? Or what is like the possible future of that? And what are the main obstacles? Wow, yeah, that's a very good, uh, good question. And uh, I, I can only give like a pers personal um, uh, perspective on, on that um, and I think it will um, it will depend on uh, also how it will be taken forward by the uh, EU member states and uh, if we will have a, a, a continuous uh, let's say increase in countries who want to adopt a um, feminist foreign, foreign policy um, for me personally I think the, the most important is to really do what we have committed to do. And, and uh, I, I think that uh, we have many, many uh, strong commitments already in place um, in all the frameworks that we have. Uh, so as again, like as a practitioner within the, the, the system, I think we can also work very well with this and it wouldn't make much difference if we would uh, take the step uh, to to speak about a uh, feminist foreign foreign policy um 
but again, I wouldn't exclude that uh, it will come up and, and become a topic for us in the next uh, yeah, year or max two, three years. Um, and it will be interesting to, to see how that uh, discussion will be, be shaped and what I think is very difficult now to, to know um, how, how strong the push will be for that and uh, what will be the outcome. But I certainly think that it's, uh, it's around the corner, uh, but it's going to be also um, a challenging, again, uh, based on, on similar ch uh, challenges as, as we said about uh, gender language, etc. that uh, again, the, there will be uh, member states on very different uh, sides in this. Uh, so again, I think my personal and perhaps too pragmatic approach, I don't know, but is that you know we have to move forward and uh, work hard on on the commitments we have already made and sometimes also working within the institution it can be frustrating when we um, when we see that gender uh, is still not included in some very important uh, political discussions or mentioned in in uh, in documents or we come in far too late in in a process so this this is still the reality sometimes uh, unfortunately and also that we have uh, we we basically we do not have the whole leadership and all colleagues uh, on board um and uh, i think here is also where we need to we need to invest in uh, uh, our own um yeah have more resources, more uh, knowledge, capacity to be applying a gender perspective in everything we do. I still believe that that is a, uh, yeah, in itself, it has a transformative uh, potential. And I would li very much like to see, and I, I'm, I'm happy that the EAS now is taking steps both uh, when it comes to gender responsive leadership, to also really give a chance for uh, those that are our um, leaders who have many different responsibilities and uh, and we are asking them to do something that we also need to make sure that we give them the possibility to learn and understand uh, what they have to do. Uh, but again, also working on like internal training, awareness raising uh, and, and getting more um, more people to, to um, open their eyes in a bit and apply the, the gender perspective. Uh, so I think that's my, my personal vision, uh, regardless of, of uh, how this discourse will develop and what we will call it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lena. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, to continue then a bit further from that, and now we start wrapping up this session quite soon. So if there are any further uh, comments or questions, then uh, please uh, put them in, in the YouTube channel. I've been trying to check it out frequently, so I see if you, if you have any comments still. But uh, from my side, still one question. Um, I wonder, Lena, what would be the key takeaway that you, you would like the participants here to remember from this uh, training and your speech? Like, um, in what way can we in our personal lives and in our career promote the feminist foreign policy and promote it in our surroundings? Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think um, first, uh, well, this is maybe not so, so much what I have been talking about, but uh, what I would like to uh, send as a key message uh, to the participants is really to also be aware of uh, our uh, gender biases and uh, to be, you know, to think a little bit critically of uh, the society around us and uh, even the organization where we work or in the family at different levels. Uh, think how uh, we are also uh, shaped uh, by these uh, gender norms that exist still and gender roles and expectations on uh, men and women. And um, I think having that realization also somehow can easier translate into concrete action to, to see what, because when we opened up the eyes and seen that, it becomes also more uh, obvious what actions we can, uh, can take. Um, and again, what I try to always tell everyone is that you don't need to become a gender expert uh, just to uh, support gender mainstreaming in your work. Uh, you need to have the interest. You can gain uh, knowledge and skills. Uh, you can read up on uh, the subject. Uh, but anyone can 
anyone can do it. And uh, the more people we have on board in, in doing that, uh, the faster we will we will get uh, somewhere. Um, and I think we, we do share uh, here uh, a joint vision that we will improve and move towards a more gender equal world. And for that, we basically need to have everyone uh, everyone on board. Thank you so much, Lena. Uh, okay, so I don't think we have any further questions from the audience at this point, but there is a lot of uh, positive remarks and uh, people thanking about this training and also about your speech, Lena, and also encouraging us to continue our work on this topic. So thank you all who have been part of this uh, event and uh, participated in this training. And I think that at this point, uh, unless Lina has something to conclude with still, um, no, it seems that she has Just to thank you for the initiative and uh, it was nice to be invited and uh, uh, en enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Exactly, yes. Also, Lina, thank you so much for coming. It has been such a pleasure and uh, I wish you, everyone, a peaceful evening and also a feminist foreign policy evening. And I hope that we can continue our exchanges later on, as also happened with the previous training. Uh, now, after this, we can continue in social media and have more discussions on this topic if there are any further questions that arise after this training course. Thank you everyone, thank you Visio and Enop for hosting, for hosting this training course and uh, let's get in touch also later on on these topics and uh, I want to still thank all of the speakers who have had brilliant presentations and given us all a lot of food for thought. I think it's very important that we can uh, work on these topics in our everyday lives, also in our careers, and learn also more about these topics. I think that was a good takeaway from Lena as well, that, uh, that we can uh, learn from the feminist foreign policy even more all the time and make our own thinking more inclusive, because every one of us has certain, um, certain gaps that we cannot see in inequalities and other matters and we we also have a small perspective unless we widen that and learn so that's a challenge for us all also from Jakob we learned a lot about the possibilities to promote this feminist foreign policy agenda in the government um, level but also in different projects that he has taken part of and uh, the the example of sweden is inspiring to us as such that they have actually coined this term in their own foreign policy and uh, political activities so i hope that we can all work towards that the eu would also uh, say that it's a proudly uh, feminist uh, foreign policy oriented union with this, I would like to end this training course and thank you all so much and let's stay in touch also after this. Good evening. Bye-bye.